So when I started the business, the Jordan business, it was a $160 million business between footwear and apparel. I, um, through the heyday, got it to $1.1 billion, Okay. Just footwear alone. We're on another legendary episode today. Um, we've had some great people on, but I think you're definitely at one of the top of the list. And I appreciate you pulling up. But I like to ever let everybody introduce themselves how they want to be introduced because I know sometimes people like get the titles and they get the stuff and like people do all the things. And I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, I want to tell this part of me today. So yeah, yeah. I'll let you tell them about yourself and who you are. All right. Um, for those of the folks out there that don't know me, I'm Gentry Humphrey, pretty much known for... Um, Starting the Jordan brand, um, actually prior to being even a Jordan brand, I was responsible for a lot of uh, Nike basketball back in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and that's pretty much what I'm known for. But to be quite honest with you, while I had a stellar career um, with Jordan and Nike, uh, the things that I'm working on these days, um, I think will have a huge impact on the next level of creatives that are out there and okay. really that's what my new journey is all about so we're at the beginning of a new chapter and i'm seeing it unfold and as i've gone back and seen things like of different interviews and different stuff that you've done mind you we'll talk about like we've met before yeah, yeah. but because i live here you know so we just <laughs> ran we crossed paths before but yeah it's dope to see people entering new chapters in life yep. and uh coming on new struggles and different things that's going to come, but you know, because you have so much experience in your past yep. and you're going to be able to like strive through that. And you're probably excited about that. I'm assuming. Oh yeah. 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 So I'm looking forward to hearing that. Um, but we always got to start from the beginning. Yep. So take me back to young you, you know, grade school times. Like what was sneakers like? Paint that picture for me for that era. Cause you know, I was born in 91. So I, yes. I heard it, <laughs> but you know, I want to hear your side at the yeah, same yeah, time. Yeah. Oh wow! So it's 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 deep. So I mean, I can go as far back as probably a seven year old kid. Okay. Um, always loved sports, and you couldn't tell me that probably by the time I got to probably about twelve, thirteen years old that I wasn't going to be a professional basketball player. Okay. Even though football was my first love. That's okay. <laughs> I played football in college. Yeah. Did you? Yeah, oh, yeah. nice. So, yeah, football was my first love growing up as a really small kid. Um, and, you know, back in the day, we didn't have the digital world that we live in now. So we would get brochures that were from local sporting goods stores. And mm -hmm. I would look at certain shoes and I just like marvel at certain shoes. And at that time, you know, at seven years old, I would sit there and, and just like, I got to have these. And, but the crazy thing is, is I was already thinking about customizing mine because, you know, back then they they came back in white, black, white, navy, nothing special. Right, right. And I was like, as soon as I get mine, I'm, I'm, I'm painting them or I'm switching shoes with one of my boys. I wear one color on the right foot, take his. If he wears the same size, wear it on the left foot. Okay, dope. I was doing all kind of yeah, crazy yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. even at that young age. And so it was just kind of who I, part of who I was and I didn't mind being kind of different. So Yeah. This so. that's crazy. It, it reminds me of like my coming up in the nineties, like watching football and seeing like the East Bay magazines. Yep. yep. And then having like uh at that time they hadn't even introduced like interchangeable swooshes that's right. yet. That's like right. no yeah. color. None so yeah. we were just taking black Sharpies and like murdering Coloring out on. the shoe yeah. and like yeah. doing the different yeah. like team colors with the yeah. red or whatever. Yeah. Like so I like how that we still got that somewhat <laughs> connection on that. Oh, part, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? If if you love this world and this culture and you have a little bit of creativity to you, you're gonna you're gonna draw the same type of people mm -hmm. around you. You mm -hmm. know, it's just kind of weird you birds of a feather flock right, together right thing. right yeah. for sure so so you're coming up you, you play did you play football too or is it just I, I played football um up until high school okay and then i shifted actually i shifted everything to basketball probably okay. when probably junior high school like okay. that was my game i mean you heard me coming before you saw me coming because i was dribbling basketball all over campus oh, okay <laughs> You hear that? <laughs> then I come around the corner. Right. Um, so yeah, so I, basketball became my my love uh, probably when I got to like the junior high school okay. uh, level. And at this time, did you have your nickname yet, or was it a different nickname? Like, <laughs> well, so yeah, e even I had the nickname that I had uh, 
as a as a kid, even I'm in kindergarten, I remember it. They called me Go Go Gentry was my okay. name. Okay, <laughs> so okay, Go Go. Okay. You was always on the move. Oh, I was always moving, okay. like never stopping. So it was Go Go, um, and then that quickly faded out. I didn't really get a true nickname from that point on, probably until I hit high school, freshman year of high school. Okay, um, it was actually. The first one was uh, Doctor G. Okay, mainly because Doctor J. J. It makes sense. And I, have, I was, I was dribbling a red, and white, and blue basketball. So, and I always liked kind of the rubber ball because it had so much more bounce. Uh-huh. So your handles had to be a little more on point with mm-hmm. those rubber balls that bounce really high. So, uh, so I was nicknamed Doctor G. And then, uh, probably by my junior year, people started calling me G Money. Okay. And then actually that stuck later on when I started working with the Jordan brand. And so G Money kind of became. Okay. That's funny. My my old, my original Instagram, uh, my original email on Yahoo was Dr. D. Cause DJ, oh, was there, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I was like thinking about that too. Oh. I was like, yeah, I remember back in the day, everybody used to call me that. <laughs> hey. So, okay. So besides that part, like family lifestyle at home like how is everything like that and what type of environment were you growing up in so i grew up in uh suburbs my father was uh he was in the air force at the time okay and so we traveled a little bit i, I primarily grew up in southern california okay um we we traveled to the east coast so i lived in new jersey for for a few years um came back to southern california which has just really been home and uh that's pretty much a suburban type you know household um at that point early on uh you know it's so funny i don't i look back and there's probably some times where i might have been in the hood but i didn't know i was in the hood right it's just like your environment <laughs> right what right it was. right yeah. and i go back now and it's definitely the hood right. but um but yeah so i but i grew up in um uh, you know a pretty diverse community um and so i had an opportunity to understand how to uh, work with people, how mm-hmm. to navigate life, you mm-hmm. know, whether it's, you know, being the, the one and only black kid in, in the classroom or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so learned early at an early stage, like how to navigate through a lot right. of things that I, I don't know. It's hard, it's hard to explain, um, the feeling of it, at least for me. Cause I was in that kind of similar, like I grew up in the, like in the hood area of Portland, yeah, yeah. but I went to school like an immersion program yeah, where I yeah. was learning Japanese half day. So wow. it was like two completely different yeah, worlds yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, in the same day. Yep, like, yep. so uh, I don't know how to, I guess, ask about how it felt when other, the way other people treated you while you were at school, I guess, if anything, cause I always felt like I was like, I never fit in when uh-huh, I was in uh-huh. school. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's so funny. Um, I really have to thank my parents for just um, instilling a sense of pride in who I was, um, sharing with me about my culture. My mm-hmm. grandparents did the same thing. And for whatever reason, maybe it's just kind of part of my makeup. Like I always had no problems carrying myself with a sense of confidence. Right. And I never had a problem being different. And my dad always preach the importance of being a leader and not a follower. Mm-hmm. And so I, it was weird for me. I just, I mean, I fit in. And even when I was in an environment that may not have been conducive to a minority, like I was the student body president or, mm-hmm. okay. you know, so, and I played sports. Okay. And so I just figured out how to fit in and it didn't bother me when, you know, people had, you know, angst against me. So mm-hmm. it was, I don't know. I, I don't know. I guess I was just one of those kids that was fortunate enough to just be yeah. able to figure out how to navigate through it. Got you. Got you. Okay. So this is now you're coming into high school. You're like, I'm in the kicks. Are you, did you get a job yet? Or are you like just worried about school, like going to college? What What's the, like the mindset, you know, like I'm going to be a senior. I'm going to be an adult one day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, surprisingly enough. Um, well, so, so, Coming up through uh, high school, I was always, um, you know, I always, again, dressed different. You know, like I, there's days I go, I want to be GQ. So I literally go there and suit. Everybody else is in. Okay. Okay. Oh, you was so, one of those yeah, guys. <laughs> I wear a suit. And then the very next day, you'll see me in, you know, denim with 
sweater tied around my neck looking preppy okay. or the next day you got me looking like jeans and a and uh you know and a t and a leather jacket like i was just always different okay so um and 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 so i'll tell you a crazy story so and i guess again it started off as a really young kid my mom used to tell me that when i was even at kindergarten um each night before i went to school i would lay out three outfits the night before. Okay. So one outfit had to be like GQ. So, and everything hooked up from head to toe. The other outfit was whatever sport I was going to play. And then the third outfit, for whatever reason, I was into Cowboys. <laughs> so okay. I had a Cowboy outfit, I think, because my grandparents were from uh, Oklahoma. So maybe that was, and they used to buy me boots every, mm -hmm. every year. I had to have a new pair of boots. So, but as a kindergartner, I would lay out outfits that I was going to wear the next day. Yeah. And then when I came back, if I want to be a football guy, and guess what? I have my football outfit. Right? Ready to go. So, again, so it was just kind of part of who I was from mm -hmm. day one. So, when I got to high school, you know, it was important to make sure my kicks worked with uh, my outfits. Um, and so, you know, I didn't have a ton because I was like, I had a lot of dress shoes and I had caps. So, I, you know, I had what I needed. Um, it wasn't really till... Uh, Till I graduate, actually my senior year probably okay. is when it really started to like go deep. What were the kicks of choice at that time? So, so it was like at really you could you could rock Dr. J's mm -hmm. and Converse. Um, you know, Nike really didn't come out till seventy two. I graduated in high school in eighty two. Okay, so. Um, so, you know, there was, uh, you know, they had some Bruins that were out there and things of that nature, but I was probably wearing more Adidas shell toes. I wore, again, I'd paint those. Right. Um, and uh, I'd wear a Bruin from time to time and, and Converse. So I was kind of like, whatever my vibe was with my outfit, you know, that's how, okay. that's how it was. So you get there um, and now you're ready to go to college. Mm -hmm. And you're like sports is out of it now at this point. Well, so again, um, so I didn't get any major Division One offers. Okay, um, I had some Division Two offers. Okay, and I was like, well, I can't get to the league going Division Two, so I decided to take uh, go to uh, junior college, get my GEs out of the way. Dope. And as I started to go, to, I said, well, I need to like, I was always like in the like, I gotta make money because. I had, a, I had a fly car. I feel that. I feel that. <laughs> my, my, I was fortunate enough. My parents said, you know, if you do all the right things in school, make good grades, you know, show your leadership skills, we'll get you a car. So I had a nice car. Okay. And I, I like, had to have my car always laid out. Right, it was right, in right. magazines and stuff yeah. like that. So I was like, okay, well, I got to do this on my own. They made me be responsible to pay for insurance and stuff. So I was like, let me get a little, do some work on the side. Mm -hmm. So I worked, went to school, played ball that first year. Long story, my uh, how how I ended up just kind of leaving the program just because we were we were running through a uh, I picked a school that had a fast pace offense, so mm. drop a dime, shoot the three, whatever. Um, coach that summer goes and gets a huge dude uh, inside, uh, and we go from running gun to like throw everything in the paint, let him get forty five, yeah, right, and, right, right. And I'm like, this is not for me, right? So I so I was working. And uh, I started working um, at Nordstrom. I was a stock guy. Okay. And uh, I just loved kind of shoes. I went to like what my second passion was. And so I said, you know, if I got to work, I'm going to do something that I enjoy. And so I worked at uh, for Nordstrom in the shoe department. That was, was your first job? My first job. Okay. I actually, my first job actually was um, I worked at a place called, <laughs> this way back in the day, it was called Wow Wow West. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it was kind of like a Miller's Outpost type thing okay, back, okay, back in okay. the day. Um, so I did that during the summer. Um, and then I moved over to uh, Nordstrom. And, you know, I was just, you know, my parents brought me up uh, in a way that they just said, be the best you can be mm -hmm. and things will take care of themselves. So like when you went to the stock room, you knew what my section was. It looked like wallpaper. It was right. like pristine. Perfect. Yeah. And so again, part of that was because I just, that was kind of instilled in me, but also because I had that love for sneakers, you know, and, and shoes in general. And so everything had to be like just right for I me. Feel to that. Feel really I feel good. that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So that allowed me to um, kind of like, 
really start to express myself in, in, in the shoe world. And, uh, you know, I, I, I advanced through the company and changed the makeup of the store as a buyer. I did a bunch of crazy things. So at that time, you know, how, because there's a lot of people that's working a job right now that's like, they're trying to be extraordinary. They're trying mm -hmm. to do those things. Uh, but people's like, bro, why are you working so hard? Like, this is somebody else's business. Da, da, da. You know, like, there's a lot yeah, of people that's yeah, like that yeah. too. So did you kind of get that? Like, as you were coming up, did you like? Oh, yeah, there, there are people that definitely say that. But again, for me, and this I carry throughout my entire career, you know, 32 years at, at, at Nike and Jordan, um, it, it proved for me to be successful. So my mentality of just being the best I could be allowed people to see things in me. Mm -hmm. So like, think about it. If, if you're doing something that you love and you're working really hard at it, first off, if it's something that you love, work doesn't feel like work. Right. Yeah. You know, so, so, so then the second thing is, is if you're dedicating the time and the hours, cause you like what you do, the perception is this dude is killing it. Right. He's here at six in the morning and he's out at, six seven in the evening like mm -hmm. and so the perception is is this guy is doing his thing and then when you have success that's attached to that people then look at it as like wow this dude is really killing it for mm -hmm. us and you know i think throughout my career i had probably when it's all said and done i might have had 17 jobs within the organization and didn't apply for so for one time, the very first. Uh, you saying that like Nike? Yeah. Oh Nike. yeah, I already understand the yeah, whole Nike yeah, thing because yeah. I talk to so many homies and they're like, "Oh yeah, I'm doing." It. I'm like, "Bro, I just seen you six months ago and you already got a new position." <laughs> yep, like, yep, I get that. Yep, I understand yep, that part. Yep. It's every two years you can't yep. be doing the same thing. Yeah. But the difference is, is if you're moving laterally, right. that's one thing. But if you're able to move up the ladder, mm -hmm. that's a whole nother thing. And so for me, like my my results allowed me to kind of move upward and mm -hmm. like i said that perception that people are it's like man this dude is just killing well yeah i might have been killed but it, it was really more for the love of what i was doing right so at that time you know you're at nordstrom uh you don't really know that all this stuff is about to unfold right. later in right. life right you're just like i'm loving it yep. and you know good things will come I keep doing my job yep. like i always say in due time like yep. in due that's time right. something's gonna come i don't know what it's gonna be that's true but i'm gonna just keep working because i know that's i can't true. control that thing it's true so uh, you don't really know what's coming next, but in that time mindset, like, what was your like, you know, what am I going to be doing ten years from now type thing? Like, yeah, so you know, at the when I first started, um, you know, at Nordstrom, I would, you know, I always had kind of artistic skills, mm -hmm. you know. So, but I was like, I don't want to be an architect, you know, like because that back then that's all you would think of is like, okay, right. you can be an architect. So my father was an attorney. And uh, he, he, you know, uh, retired from the military, became an attorney, and I was really into law, you know, uh, and I wanted to be a criminal uh, attorney. Okay. And so, um, so I was like, well, what I'll do is I'll just, you know, uh, I'll go to law school, I'll, you know, pay bills and stuff while I'm still working here. And worst case scenario, if I ended up going to law school and become a corporate attorney for someone like Nike, then, okay, cool. That, that could be one avenue. Okay. Um, so I started working at Nordstrom and um, I, I developed um, what I call a personal book. And my personal book just, you know, whenever I had just about every customer I had, I wrote their name down, Dope. note their sizes down and just would call them when stuff that I thought they would like would come in. Had such great, um, rapport with several customers that ended up being life friends and mentors. And, um, and they really kind of, uh, just allowed me to network, mm -hmm. you know, I was networking and didn't really know right, I was networking, right, you know, right. it's huge. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it really changed my life in, in so many ways. And so, um, while I was working there, um, again, just killing it doing well, I became the number one salesperson, in the store, then in the footwear division for the company. Mm -hmm. And they saw kind of me just continuing to elevate and they offered me a position to be a buyer for the store. Okay. When I did uh, that, okay. Okay. yeah, yeah. When I did that, that's when everything changed because I went back to my roots. Uh, I was in a store that um, 
in a city where where folks love sneakers. And so I changed the makeup of uh, of the inventory that we had in the footwear department when I mm-hmm. became a buyer. Introduced kind of the athletic division to Nordstrom um, because I had such a good business. So is this for like that specific store for the region for yeah, the nation yeah. for what? So so it started off for that particular store okay. because back then each store bought individually. Okay. So these people, all the other stores started seeing that I was killing them like, because I had a whole different mix. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're yeah, like, yeah. "What's going on?" And then I was so fortunate to have a guy, a guy named Bill Smith, who was just a great mentor for me. Young uh, when I was young there. And he's like, you know what? We're going to start a new athletic division for the company because you're killing it. Now everybody else wants to do it. Mm -hmm. So we did that and started to change the mix. And then obviously at the time, Nike was really big. So they were like, hey, Red Rover, Red Rover, let's bring you right over. Right, (laughs) right, right. And so that's how that That's so wild because like how it just, I don't know if it's a full circle thing or whatever, but I just think about like, going me to uh get the countdown packs at nordstrom oh yeah. and it was oh, low-key nobody knew cool. about it yep. i'm like they got a jordan account like it's super low-key yep. and it used to be the spot and i used to go get like all the high drops there and it's like that was all still tied <laughs> to your like yep. doing it yep. before, yep. You before you got, you got there, there and yep. then being a Coming part of back. that stuff yep. like yep. crazy how that stuff works so you get the call and they're like what's up you coming to nike or what <laughs> Yeah, it was a very easy decision. <laughs> um, again, because I was that guy that just loved this world. Um, yeah, I was like, okay. And I was I had taken the LSAT and I said, that's when I said, you know what? Worst case scenario, you know, and I I knew I didn't want to be in retail all my life. Okay. Uh, I just the hours, especially during the holidays, I know thinking about when I got older and been having a family, I like, I couldn't do retail. So for me, I ended up uh uh, it was an easy, you know, easy move. And so I went to, um, when they offered me to, to go to the comp, go to move over, I was like, Hey, I'm in. Okay. And so, so it was pretty easy. After that. You're living in California, mm-hmm. working there close to home, same area. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And then you get the call and they're like, you got to move there immediately when it happened. Well, so luckily I got a chance for a little bit to, to stay within the Southern California area. Um, but I was really responsible for a lot of things that happened in the sales division. Okay. Um, but I was really more in tune with, with the product creation guys because, again, because I was the basketball dude, the product creation guys would come down to Southern California and they'd be right. like, okay, where do I go? You know, and I'm like, I got you. I take them to all the hot spots. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I really found myself like really in tune with with those guys. So. I started while I was really in sales. I kind of worked with those guys almost more than I worked with the sales guys. Um, then they, a position came available where um, I could move up to Oregon and uh, basically, you know, be part of the product creation team. So what year was this? This was like uh, 89, 90. 89, 90. Okay. So at this time, yeah, Jordan's already in the league. Nike is making a scene. The Jordan shoes are doing their thing, but you're working with Nike directly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now they're like, move up to here. Did you move without even coming here before or had you come and made a visit first? Yeah, or? I had been here. And I was like, there's no way in the world I'm going to Portland. I was just about to ask you. I was like, what did you think when you first got yeah, here? I was like, there's. Especially then. Oh, coming from Southern California where the weather's always good and it's always raining here. I was like, man, I'm like, I'll never go there. And as soon as I said that, and that's why you never say never. Right, 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 right. Because as soon as uh, the opportunity came, uh, I ended up moving up. And, uh, you know, it was. So this is kind of like your first time leaving, leaving the nest a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Cause yeah. You, when you went to college locally. Yeah. I was here for a minute. Yeah. It was know? like you, everything was there. Yeah. I, Cause yeah. I think about that too. Like, man, I remember that first time going off to college, like, yeah, it, it you know, was... not being like close to home. Yeah. So yeah. how did that kind of go? Just like mentally kind of coming up here? Like I got to make friends. I, I already got people. I oh, know, it was, like, man, it was crazy. Cause you know, especially them. Portland isn't huge, diverse. No, nah, yeah, we're like 4% yeah, or something like that. Yeah. And so, and then it was even worse. So I come up and again, always been into cars. Mm-hmm. So coming from Cali, I transfer up here. I got my car and it's laid out. 
and has California tags on it <laughs> <laughs> still they until my you. organ tag. Especially oh, on Beaver, dude. What? Oh, my gosh. What? They were all over me, like, like giving me the dirty looks. And, and, yep. and even within the organization, there was – you know, there was not a ton of diversity oh, within no. the company. And so literally, you know, it was it was different. It was really different. That, that was going to be my next question, too. Like, remember how we talked about fitting in and, yep. and being in that environment um, in high school? Yep. And it kind of worked. Yep. But then when you got to here at Nike and the type of people that are here, now you're talking about like real life adults. That's right. The workspace. That's right. It could be completely different. 100%. So, how did it kind of go and how did you kind of navigate that mentally where you're like, okay, I need to adapt to these things or I need to like be strong on what I believe yeah. in or whatever, you know, what yeah. were those kind of. Well, you, you learn to, um, you do things where you don't sacrifice, you know, your personal morals and ethics. Mm -hmm. Um, you learn by trial and error. Cause there's a lot of things that I, I think early on that I did, had I known the outcomes or had I known other ways to go about doing it like I did later on in my career. Mm -hmm. If I had applied those things early, I probably would even had a even, you know, a quicker road to success. So what do you, what do you think were those things? Like yeah. So, so, so I'll just give you an example. So, uh, you can't, um, you're always going to have to, to learn the art of negotiation. Yeah. Like you're never going to be 100% right. Even if you are, mm -hmm. you're not going to be 100% right. right. Because there's someone with a bigger business card that might not want to do that, might not get it. Might You might have all the research, done the data, everything. But in a company, you know, especially a Fortune 500 company, there's folks that can always trump that decision. Mm -hmm. So for me, what I learned, you know, I used to wear my emotions on my sleeve. like, mm -hmm. And my my mentality was like, what you see is what you get. I have no hidden agendas. Like you can respect me for where I'm coming from because there's no hidden agendas. Early on, that did not work well. Right, right. You know, because because I was expecting everybody else to operate that way. And they way. didn't react the oh, same way you was no, expecting. No, yeah. no. So so once you learn how to play the game and you learn like the power of influence and how you can influence people and how you can do things to get uh the things that you ultimately need and how you can be smart about getting those things that be, that's when I became. So you're, you're like, I'm getting power. Not only you can get power in so many different ways and people can use it in the wrong ways. Right. So you found ways to have proper power um, without doing like bad things, still being true to yourself, doing all those things. So um, how did you kind of leverage that to move up? And take that game to the next level. Uh, so, so we used to talk about um, learning how to manage up. Okay. And so for me, when when I was told that I needed to learn how to manage up, I was like, to me, that sounded like you want me to kiss your ass to to, to get where I need to go. Right, that's right. what it sounded like. Yeah, yeah. And 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 that's how I took it early on. But what it when I really truly understood what it meant is when, like I said, I became really powerful. And what it really means is that you can be in a certain situation, but how you articulate your thoughts, mm -hmm. um, how you craft your story, mm -hmm. how you, um, and whether that's in a deck format or whether it's just in speaking, um, and how you work with people at a higher level, mm -hmm. that's when you can truly become powerful okay and that's really what what the nature of, of managing up was for me when i understood that it was you know it was a quick ride and i think that's one of my struggles that i have right now um I, i'm like this is what you get this is yeah, i'm straightforward i don't cut i don't like i cut all the other stuff out you know i'm like this is what i need da, 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 da. but it becomes like too direct or this or you're aggressive all this stuff and i'm like no, I have best intention, all those things, but sometimes I can understand how it comes off this yeah, way. Yeah. But then it's like, okay, now I have to, then I started going through the whole thing of like, oh, I'm conforming to what everybody else yeah. wants me to be and all of this yeah, stuff. Yeah. And I'm like fighting with that. And then like my wife would be like, just look how you say it, say it this way. And yeah. I'm like, but that's what they want me to say. Da, da, da. Like, but, but, so. but you gotta, you gotta know the battles and how to win the battle. You know, they talk right. about, do you want to win the war? Or you want to win the battle? Yeah. You know? And 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 so 
what I learned. I was I was just like you. Yeah. I, th- I feel like I'm coming out of that, but I'm still like, I can't say I'm not all the way out yeah, of it. Yet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But but what you'll notice though is in the end, if you can prioritize things and you can get the things that you really want. So so I'm I'm gonna give you an example. One of the things I used to teach like my guys quite often. And this is kind of like speaks to the power of negotiation. I'm a person who likes to do a lot of things and everything in threes because mm-hmm. I think it's very simple. Like you go past three, then people start to forget. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, right. so, so what I would tell my team is like, look, you got to make priorities. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if you are going into a meeting where you know there's going to be some controversy, figure out what it is that you have to win. Okay. There's a priority that you have to win because if you don't win that one priority, then guess what? It's going to have a devastating effect on other things that you got to do. Then you take your second priority. You're like, okay, yeah, I really want to win this. But in the end of the day, if I don't win this, okay, I- I'll be able to live. At least we got the first one. Yeah. yeah. But, and then the third one is like, okay, you know what? This is one out of all the priorities. Wow, I would love to have this one. If I lose this one, it's no big deal. Okay. So what I would tell my team is I was like, look, so when you go into these negotiations, try to control the agenda. Start with the one you're willing to give up. Got you. Because what's going to happen is, is you go in there, you negotiate, you talk, talk. Ultimately, you're going to give it up. And you're like, okay, you give it up. Right. Well, now what you've done is you put the defense mechanisms down. Now, now people are open to hearing what you got to say. They're not so worried about protecting their point of view. Mm-hmm. They just got to win. Mm-hmm. And as you move up, mo- everybody knows you're not going to win everything. Mm-hmm. So now you go straight to the one that you have to win, your number one okay. priority. Okay. 95% of the time, you will get that one because they just got one. You got to get one. Then the third one, which is the second, was your second priority. Sometimes you win it. Sometimes you lose it. But think about it. You won the war. Right. Because you went in there with the, with the notion of your priorities. Mm-hmm. And you walked out of there with the game plan that you went in there with. That's winning the war. Mm-hmm. I like that. I like that. I appreciate <laughs> that. I appreciate that. So sometimes you got to you got to give to get. Yeah. You know, just nah, but sure. if you if you prioritize it and you know the one that you have to have and you win that one, you good. Okay. So Back on topic. <laughs> we got, you're at Nike. Mm-hmm. Um, how long were you at Nike before you went to Jordan brand? Well, so Jordan wasn't even a brand well, when yeah, I went there. Like so yeah, Jordan like didn't yeah. start till uh, 97, 98. Yeah. Um, and so we built product a year and a half out. So we, I was working on the stuff before it became a brand. So okay. um, it didn't really become its own brand until seven or eight years after I had started. Okay. But I was already doing uh nike basketball um which you know back then mj was getting a a portion of the uh flight business okay and so i was working on that along with working on all the other great stuff the barclays pennies yeah just great era that that, that was the best (laughs) unmatched yes yes. i don't know if we're gonna ever be able to reach that point again i I don't think and and i'm telling you like I worked with a crew of so many talented people. Um, you know, this guy, guy that um, brought me in, his name was David Bond. He was really, really super talented. Um, I worked with a ton of talented, you know, designers. Um, it, it was just, we had teams that were just second to none. Mm-hmm. I mean, the way we approached the understanding of the game and not being a, afraid of trying new things and doing different like the team was you know there was so many good guys mm-hmm. um that era i i truly believe it was the best era for for basketball oh so during this time too you're like learning all these things about running businesses and managing big dollars and all this stuff and it's like did you at that time in the mid 90s did you f- see yourself having your own brand now like or was it just like this is what i'm gonna do i'm retire i'm be good like no you know it's so funny i was uh i was living the good life because you know i i really feel like i've been blessed you know it was funny people back in the day would ask me like like how did you get this job you know and, mm-hmm. and i used to say you know it's a matter of being at the right place at the right time but i when i started thinking about that that's not really correct like i think a lot of the things that I did early on put me in a position to kind of 
be where I am, mm-hmm. you know, but I, it was a lot of having to do with following my passion, mm-hmm. you know, so leaving Nordstrom, not playing hoops and going to my second passion, which was kind of just a whole footwear world and fashion. And so, you know, so, so I went down that lane. Um, and honestly, again, my mentality was just like, be the best. And I was having fun, mm-hmm. you know, I was culturally relevant. Like I was just applying, like I knew the world that loved the sneaker game. Mm-hmm. If we just did the right thing, they're come. Right. You know, I right. was living, I was kind of trying to be the voice of the consumer from a cultural standpoint. And, you know, when you think of basketball culture, you think of music, mm-hmm. you think of fashion, mm-hmm. you think of art and, you know, sport itself. So that was just the world that I lived in. And I was like, I'm going to make sure we do what's right by the consumer that's like me. How did you research culture then to researching culture now? Because I feel like two completely different worlds, yeah, like, yeah, especially yeah. with social media and everything. Yeah, yeah. It's different, but it's kind of the same. Okay. And I, I, th- I say it's kind of the same because you still have the love of those four elements. Mm-hmm. They live in both worlds. You're right. It's different in the sense of, you know, the digital world we live in, you have access to so many things that, you know, yeah. in such a quick manner. Um, but for me, the 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 key was being able to authentically tell stories that people could relate to. Mm-hmm. And so if you could veneer a product that tells that story, people can relate to you and they're going to rock with you. Mm-hmm. And that's that no matter where you are, what area you're in, people can respect and appreciate what you do if it comes from an authentic place. So I think of when I when I think of Nike or Jordan, both, everybody says the same thing compared to other brands. They are built off of storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. So are you the goat of storytelling or did you get it from somebody else? Or how did you know, how did that all like really align where you like I got to tell a story through this product. Yeah. So, so I learned from, you know, folks who kind of taught me. And like I said, that one guy, David, he was really good at it, but I just kind of applied it to the mm-hmm. culture because I was more connected to the culture. Right, right. Um, and, and when I realized that like one day I was in a museum and I saw this painting by Picasso and I went up to this painting. I was like, shit, I could do that. Right. You know, I'm like, this dude's got these crazy <laughs> geometric shapes. Yeah. He's got eyeball over here, eyeball over there, these dark areas, these bright areas. This is like kind of random stuff. And I was like, this is where how many million? Like, right. I could do this, right. you know. And then so I looked at it, I was like, okay, whatever. And then I read the story about what he was going through in his life. And it talked about the dark times and everything in the dark part of the painting represented mm-hmm. the dark times of life. But that eyeball that said in that was him being able to see and have a vision that things are going to be better. And you look at the bright side of it, and then that eyeball in the bright was like, hey, I've come to this resolution mm-hmm. that things are good. Like, and so now the story started to make sense to me. And I look back at the painting with a whole new level of respect. And I just basically said, like, that's what we have to do. Mm-hmm. If we want to connect with consumers, we got to tell stories, allow them to respect and appreciate where we're coming from. Like the painting... They still might not like the painting, but at least they can respect that it has a purpose and it has a place that it came from. Mm -hmm. And so for me, being able to stay connected to the culture and tell stories, I think that's where most people give me, you know, a lot of my praise or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I feel like a lot of stuff that I've seen, (laughs) everybody just cares about like your relationship with Jordan. Right. And they like don't want to know much about you. And I'm like, <laughs> I want to know more about you. So I'm like, what can you tell me? Yeah, you had the golden times and all that stuff, but yeah. like, was there any struggles in that moment or any things that like you start to second guess things or like this is can't be this good for this long? Like something's having to happen, like cause that happens to a lot of people. You mean about my career? Yeah, or just like with- while you're in the middle of that career as yeah. we're, you know, working to the two thousands era. Yeah. So so um you know, I've always kind of prided myself on uh, being able to identify good, talented people. Mm-hmm. And so I just loved um, finding folks that I feel like had the passion, um, had the eye, um, and anything that I could do to kind of help them grow mm-hmm. um, was really what it was all about for me. 
And so being a leader, I, th I think that was really good. But being a leader, you know, there comes a lot of things that you have to do that sometimes you may not want to do. Mm -hmm. And and there were times where, like, I felt like, especially if you're you're charged with the task of creating a vision. Mm -hmm. Like most people know what they like today. They don't know what they're going to like in the future. Right. And we're building products a year and a half out. I know that is so crazy. I always talk about that all the time. It's like y'all can literally control what the new trend is going to be That's a year right. and a half from now, two years from now. Yeah. Like I see projects five years y'all been working on it. Yeah. And it's like it just dropped. That's right. And and it's it's a difficult thing to do, but um so so sometimes you have to be able to uh convince people that this is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you gotta do that with people who aren't even connected to the culture. Mm -hmm. And but they have bigger business cards than you, and so again, how you articulate, how you manage up, mm -hmm. all becomes part of that that you know uh, task and getting what you need done. And so there's times where I was just like, dude, the juice is not worth the squeeze. Like I'm pounding it out. I know this is the right thing to do, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm selling people on the idea. They're still not getting it. I'm like I can't keep beating my head up. You know, like. Uh, it's just not work. It becomes not worth it at times. So you're coming home from work at the end of the day, like, <sighs> oh, beat up, yeah. like feeling like you just got abused. <laughs> right, right. It's like nobody uh, listening to me. Like, yeah, I can't. Like, yeah. this ain't working. And the mental struggle is real. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I've always, you know, when I was able to find the balance to to like work life balance, like I realized that was really healthy for me because while I thought I was grinding and and always putting out a hundred percent you really aren't when you're when you're mentally not fully there yeah, yeah so but there are times like yeah i go home like man just drained and uh but my it's funny my creative time comes to me like usually between like one and like four in the morning so so it just comes and then uh, I always keep, you know, either uh, my phone nowadays, but it used to be pad and paper next to me and I'd write stuff down because mm -hmm. I didn't want to forget it when I woke up, mm -hmm. but I'd write it down and make it happen. Sometimes I just stay up and just make it happen. Um, but yeah, man, it's, it's the, the, the having the ability to kind of um, uh, want to do some things that you know are really right and then not being able to do them and then... Then, or even being able to do something after people have finally said, okay, go ahead. Right. And then it works. Right. And they're like, then they take right. all the praise. Like, oh, no, <laughs> yeah. 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 The, both of those things are like, really? Right. I feel that. So like relationships and all the other stuff outside of work, like you having a great time, but you think this is a, also like affecting that in certain ways. Like how did you manage the other mental side of like, you know, some people, they go, go on a run, they go ride their bike, they yeah, yeah, play yeah. music. They do yeah, like, yeah. what was your kind of like my outlet? Your outlet. My outlet is really playing basketball. Um, so you're I still getting look, buckets. Yeah. Okay. I, I, st okay. I, I'm still putting them up. Um, and then, you know, listen to music. Uh, nowadays is playing golf. Okay. I, I love golf. So I play a lot of golf and it's my, it, you know, golf to me is a fabulous game because, if I told you, say, hey, look, man, uh, I'm on a four hour meeting. You want to meet with me for four nope. hours? You'd be like, hell no. Go play golf. <laughs> but so, yeah, but, you, but yep. you'll play golf. Yep. And so you've got a person's undivided attention for literally four hours where you learn a lot about a person. Mm -hmm. You know, guys out there cheating, you're like, okay, you're right. cheating out here. You're right. probably cheating in life. Yep. You know, like, so, so there's so many things that you can do um, that for me, golf has just been a great outlet. And you're, you know, it's really a battle against yourself in the course. You're Definitely. not, you know, yeah, you can play your friends for money and you want to win. But at the end of the day, it's you got to hit the shot mm -hmm. and you mess up. It's on you. It's not on anybody else. So, yeah. So that's been, that was. A, that's OK, been a I like that. What's the, what's <laughs> one of your most legendary golf games that you've had? My, my best score that I've ever shot. I shot a 69, Okay, uh, which is really good. It was yeah. one of those days where. You know, those don't happen very often, right. <laughs> <laughs> at least not for me. For some some folks, they do. But uh, it was funny because the day before I had played and I shot a 70 and the the 18th hole, I double bogey the 18th uh, hole. So okay. I was like, it could have been even better. I could have, you know, shot 68. Right. 
And I was like, dang. So then the very next day I went and played and I shot 69 and uh, it was just, everything was working. Like, That's good. And then those don't happen that often. <laughs> Cause, and then in the game of golf, you literally can go out and shoot 69 one day and then come back and shoot 89. Right. And it's the same, like, it's just the day later. Yeah. And so many dynamics of the swing, the conditions. It's a tough game to master. Nah, definitely. For sure. <laughs> um, okay. So that's all happening. Again, you're learning and just putting all these tools in your bucket, in your shed of just like managing big businesses, relationships, yep. getting, finding ways to reduce stress. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're coming through the years. And obviously, yeah, you do the legendary again, because that's the, I'm coming, I started 2006. So yep. Yep. DMP pack, we yep. name it, yep. you know, all the classic stuff that came out. Yep. Um, but you kind of get to more of the tail end of the career and you're like, where are you at now? You're like, yeah. I want to be done with this. I want to start my own thing. Cause you were already doing uh basketball courts and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, yeah. So 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 I'll tell you a crazy story. So um, and I'm really bad with years. So it's hard for me to remember the years. <laughs> but um at one point, so so when I started the business, the Jordan business, it was a hundred and sixty million dollar business between footwear and apparel. Okay. And I, um, through the heyday, got it to 1.1 billion. Okay. Just footwear alone. And I had to do a little bit of apparel in between there, but so we had got to 1.1 billion. And then the company, and primarily the business was done domestically. Like 90% of the business was done in the US. So they came to me and said, hey, look, if this is going to go to the next level, we've got to go global. And we want you to take on this global GM role okay. and we're going to give you three people to work with you to take on the rest of the world. And I was like, and you know, and, and to me, the report card for me was like watching all the kids line up for, at the retail stores for the shoe. I'm like, job well done team. We're good. Right, right, right. And now you're asking me to go tackle the rest of the world with three people. And matter of fact, the rest of the world in most places don't even care about basketball. Right. And I'm going to have to fight with the Nike priorities. Like, them getting it over the top. They got more people. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this feels like a setup. Like I was, I was like, this you're really trying to get me out. This? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh ultimately though, what it ended up doing is it not only changed the my career, but it actually changed my life mm -hmm. personally. Um I started to um realize that basketball culture lived everywhere else in the world right you just had to find it mm -hmm. like i had nike people take me to london one time i said tell me where the hot spots are they took me to this court and these dudes were playing in birkenstocks and black socks and i was like this ain't it right. <laughs> and so then i found some guys they're like no you need to go here you need to go here and literally it was like you were in the states I went to Paris and found that well the the whole event. I don't know if you've heard of it, but the K fifty four event. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like I, I want to go one day. Oh, I, you I, dude, you have to go. I know. It I know. is the best experience. I want to go. I need There's to nothing. Go. I, I was there with uh, Lethal Shooter last yeah, summer. Yeah, yeah. And he was like, "Gee, there's nothing like this." And it looks just it's the energy. Phenomenal. Like it looks so dope. Phenomenal. It looks so dope. And the very yeah. first one was well, these guys were playing on this busted court. People were hanging in trees. And all you heard was the music. And I looked at it and I was like, this is it. This is the heart of the culture right oh, here. Oh, right here. Yeah. You yeah. wouldn't even know you were in Paris. You would have thought you were in New York or wherever. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, so so what, the reason I say it changed my life is because I realized that basketball culture lives all over the world. Mm -hmm. And so what I ended up doing is um, I started my own foundation. I call it the Urban Country Club. And it was just basically me being able to um, build basketball courts in underprivileged parts of the world. Mm -hmm. I had kids come in and help us build these courts because I didn't want to just come in and then leave. And then, you know, they're like, whatever. Yeah, So so we have like 50, 60 kids help us build these courts. Then we come up with the theme. We have another ki uh, 50, 60 kids that have interest in art. We build a mural around the court. Oh, okay. And then we um, donate the court back to the community. We have a festival where, you know, all the kids that helped, we give them free product and all that stuff. Invite another 1,500 kids to come to the event and just experience sport, music, art, all that. Dope. And uh, we dedicate it back to them so that when we leave, all those people that had, you know, a time, whether it was just enjoying the moments or they put in some work, 
like they feel like it's theirs. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so, so, so I, so that, but that was just one thing that allowed me to change, you know, change my life personally. But I realized that, you know, you could have a bigger impact than just creating cool sneakers. Right. Like the impact that like the K54 does in Paris, like it's one of the only events that people of color have a chance to come together in a big city like Paris, a major city like Paris and just celebrate mm -hmm. and is celebrating the culture that they know and love. And so that was like the springboard for me to see things differently. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, this creating great products is, is, is like very cool, but it's bigger than that. Mm -hmm. That's when you became global G. <laughs> <laughs> literally, literally, literally. So literally. that, that is a, uh... It's it's so dope how I always tell people it's more than sneakers. Like we can do so many things because I love like giving away shoes too and being a part of like somebody's story. Because like once you give them that pair of shoes, like they're never gonna forget that. That's right. That's they're right. gonna wear them and they're, and they're gonna have stories that they created. That's them. right. They're gonna That's come right. and tell you That's someday. Right. That's you right. may never even see the person again. That's right. That's Either right. way, something dope. So. Yeah. I love how uh, you did that, and you're still doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's that was the impetus for me now starting my own brand. Mm -hmm. um, I just felt like like the world had become, especially sneaker world, had become like collaborations. Like everybody thought <laughs> collaborations was the thing Don't to get do. Me started. Oh <laughs> my god! And then it got to the point where, and honestly, like the very first collaboration, like I sat down with the guys at Undefeated, and we talked. We did the. Uh, the uh, underfitted for, uh -huh. and that was going to be the springboard into collaborations. Like the original idea was to to work with them, and then I had other retailers on the list. Mm -hmm. We would build products in their likenesses and tell stories. But uh, the key was that a portion of that was supposed to go back to charity. Mm. Didn't necessarily Got happen the club that way. They so, wanted so I, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so I was like, "This is not cool." So I kind of went away from. It. But uh. but 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 it, again, like. Me starting my own company, I was like, okay, you know what? Everybody's doing these collaborations and everybody's going to people that are already well known. Mm -hmm. Well, I started running into people that nobody knew about mm -hmm. that had crazy talent. And so I was like, you know what? These people now need a platform. Everybody's going to go to the go to guys, the well known right. guys. So you already know them. Yeah. yeah. Let's find these folks who have the potential, who have the skill set. But don't have the means of doing it. Mm -hmm. And so me starting my own company, that's really what it was about is how do I allow – same way that I work with a, uh, an athlete, an NBA player. We build a shoe in his likeness. becomes his signature shoe. Mm -hmm. He gets royalties from that shoe. Company sells that shoe. And the world hopefully likes that shoe. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like we can do that with creative folks. Right. I can sit down with someone they can – create a shoe based on my brand, we can sell it for them and I can give them the royalties the mm -hmm. same way that we would give an athlete the royalties on that side, give that to that creative person so that that person can now go off and start their own company. Or if they're young, like we're working with a co with the art center school in, out of LA, kids that are as young as eight years old. Mm -hmm. If that person, while he's not going to start his own company at eight, we can use those funds for him to go, to design school or mm -hmm. whatever. So use it as scholarship money. So that was the impetus. I feel like I was blessed in so many ways, had a fabulous career, but giving back right. is what it's really all about. And that's what makes it sustainable, paying it forward to the next generation of creative right. folks. And I think uh, same thing, like story, right? Like the story behind the brand allows it to stay alive. That's right. Which, I mean, obviously, we can't say it's like seven years old yet, but right. I, I can see why it could go that far yes. and be, you know, yes. deep into the game years from now yep. um, because of that story and people understanding, like, it's not just a pair of shoes. That's right. Like, you think of, like, Toms and what they yeah, do yeah, and yeah, different yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. People understand that story. It becomes a commonly known yep. thing. Yeah. So yep. I love uh, that part and how you do it. And it's, it's cool because... Like you basically created like PEs yep. and yep. Uh, collaborations. Yep. Like yep. those essentially came from you when yep. it comes to like way back in the day. Yep. Yep. And now again, it's about to come into the game again. Like yep. I saw you were working like Randy Moss and yeah, those yeah, different yeah. guys yeah, and yeah. creating different colorways. So yep. right now you have their models that are going to be available to the public or they're going to have like their own PEs or like how are you going <laughs> to yeah, go yeah. about it's, that? It's kind of the same, very similar format. So, you know, the name of the company is called Code. Um, and primarily because there's always a code. Right. Like if you have the 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 code to unlock something, 
you're in, you know, you're in and whatever it is. And so, um, so that's kind of really what, where it comes from. And what I will be doing is working with various people, unknown people, as well as well-known people to come up with their version of the code. And the code is basically telling your story through product. Mm -hmm. And, um, again, cause I think that's authentic. And, um, and so, yeah, so we'll sit down with, uh, folks like Randy Moss, folks like Kevin Hart, for several folks that are that are within our portfolio, mm -hmm. and we'll do their code version. Mm -hmm. And so people will come on to the website. Uh, Randy's code will probably be something like six six seven seven. So that's Moss in digital. Oh, format. okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you guys had that for the event. I saw you had the numbers. Like, yeah, yeah. And everything Atlanta. is yeah, again, yeah, being. Trying to tell stories yeah. and making sure, like even the the logo itself, like we talk about being able to take care of uh, consumers twenty four seven. So if you look at our our code logo, the C in the secondary logo is seven dots in the C, mm. twenty four dots in the rest of the word code. Okay, twenty four seven. Like everything is a story. Damn, that's <laughs> dope. So how do you even like? get that detailed and go that deep into telling that story because i think a lot of people that have their own brands that have their own thing going on like they want to feel like i don't know how to explain it but you know how sometimes people be like what i'm doing is not cool enough yeah right yeah. but it's like everything everybody's doing is cool enough yeah but when you can take it that far yeah and make it that intricate then it's like that's what makes it cool right yeah. that's what yeah. makes it deeper something that's right. still that's so right. how do you like find the 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 skills to dig that deep to be honest with you i don't know <laughs> some of it i think is just um instinctually like I, i'm just that detailed oriented mm -hmm. um and i just think it adds more authenticity to the story so so you know a lot of times it's it's the one thing that you know you go to school and you wonder like back in high school you everybody says this Am I ever going to use this when I grow up? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody yeah, says yeah, that. Yeah. But honestly, like research, I do a lot of research. Like when I come up with a concept that I think will be cool, I research it out. Mm -hmm. Like I go deep. And then the deeper you go, you find little nuggets that just add so much more meaning to mm -hmm. whatever your story is going to be. So it's kind of like that Picasso thing with everything kind of being detailed and you look deeper into the image and you hear the story. And then now it's like, you got so many different aspects to it. So right now you have three different models. Yep. yep. And, uh, and then different colorways for each model and yep. everything. 17 um, different colorways. What's your retail price point on everything? And then what's like the kind of plan for the, the type of audience that you're, you know, that going after. So, um, I believe that, um, you know, trends like the, the, the millennials actually changed the sneaker game in the sense of you used to be, <laughs> you used to be able to, uh, to like almost predict that trends were going to change. So it used to be sneakers would be hot and sneakers would have usually a longer run. So you'd get like a, you know, seven to 10 year run on sneakers. Yeah. I, I remember that. I yeah. Remember that. yeah. Then it would flip. And then people would do the boots. So Doc yep. Martens would get hot. Timberlands would get hot. They went on a shorter one. they go like three to five years. Yep. Yep. And then it would be like dress shoes, like hard so hard bottoms would be good. And, and that would even go on a little shorter run. Yeah, people people were rocking the Spurries back in the yeah, day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> so, and so the millennials came in and basically said, like, we rocking with this athletic look. And we've been on like a 20-year run. Mm -hmm. And so... I feel like at some point the trend is going to shift a little bit, but there's things that this that that consumers today have grown to love about the sneaker culture. So mm -hmm. the comfort element of it, yeah, the fact that you don't have to wear hard bottom shoes and your feet are hurting the whole time. Excuse me, and you have the ability to dress it up. Well, to me. You can take a shoe like Air Force One and it pretty, oh, white, white Air Force One can almost go with everything. Right. You know? Right. But if you wear it with a suit, it can go, but it really, like, right. it doesn't go. Right. You know, it goes, but it doesn't go. Yeah. So, so what my brand is trying to do is give you that elevated proposition. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see, and then I, I try to, every, every model has a reason for, for its existence. 
And then I try to create three different personalities. So if you ultimately love one of my styles, mm -hmm. you're going to be able to get it in multiple ways. So if you see it in all white, it looks kind of like a luxury athletic sneaker. Mm -hmm. If you see it in all black, you can definitely wear it with a suit of how we've treated it with materials and colors. And you can dress it up, wear it with a suit very easily. Mm -hmm. And then I do a what I consider a fashion version. So if you want to go out to the red carpet, if you're going out with your girl at night and you want to you know, step it up and be a little fly, you can rock it with suede or spikes or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so you can take that one shoe and three different personalities and you'd be good. Just like you do when you was a little kid. That's, <laughs> you know what? Yeah. It is kind of like that. Yeah. And it really is. That's dope. So so that's that's kind of what it what it's all about. Um, and then, you know, like I said, it's a platform for me to kind of connect with uh creatives, right. uh, young creatives. That's really like like I said, I've been blessed and now it's this is my way of giving back. Right. So it's uh, almost like yeah, a form of like philanthropy, a bit is yep. kind of like it's a business. We got to make money still. Yep. You know, yep. people. I got people working for me, so yep. I got to make sure they can That's get right. paid. But That's at the right. same time, like we're about to go change the game yeah, and help a lot of people That's at the right. same time. That's right. That's and right. and I mean, yeah, how many brands can say that? Yeah, especially uh, in your competition because. I mean, yeah, what do we, I don't know who we look at. Kohan, like yeah. you got some other couple, well, like it, exactly. But you look at some of those others, and you know the the consumer that I'm targeting, they're looking at those like, yeah, my dad rocked those, right, know? right, like, right. I'm not really trying to rock. So I give them a little bit of uh, a little bit of athletic swag, just elevate it, mm -hmm. so that one you get in the comfort, and that's some of the things I started with. Like, so I've been in the game long enough to know, like. Okay, you've got margin targets that you're look, trying to hit from right. a business standpoint. And I know the first thing that usually goes are the sock liners and shoes. Like, you put a cheap sock liner <laughs> yeah. in it because the outside is they what everybody cares all the, about. All the retros all the time. I'll be like, bro, why y'all do that? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yep. And so, so me, I started there. So when you put on my shoes, like most people, are, that's the first thing I'm like, dang, these things feel great. And I paid close attention to it. Uh, it was important for me. And so I started there. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, it was about, you know, the styling and how you can create some versatility in the styling. Oh, so um, you said you're, how many colors? 17? 17, 17 total. 17 colorways, total. Yeah. What do you uh, see it being as like in the future? Do you think it's going to be like, we're going to go heavy with these three models. We're going to start introducing new lines, like starting to hit different other audiences or like, yeah, I'm like for me, like I just started merch for my YouTube channel, uh, and uh, I got like a couple shirts. Like we do, we got the ain't got them tees. We got a little sneaker department stuff. I got a couple of tees I'm gonna drop, but you can go with like a bunch of different designs, or you can like just beat the drum on these certain yeah, things yeah, for a yeah. while. Yeah, and I think a lot of people that's getting started on their own brands, they're trying to figure out like, what should I do? Should I have all these different things? Should I try yeah. to like master this one thing? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think everybody has to figure out what's best for them. For me. I try to let the consumer decide. Mm -hmm. So, so, so if if I'm in a space where um, consumers vote by their purchases and they love one style over the other, then I'm going to make sure that I hang on to that model mm -hmm. for a decent amount of time. But I'm going to give them fresh looks. Like mm -hmm. I'm going to give it to them in a way that's different. And if that becomes a staple in our brand, it's like it's like you can't you can't um, say that you're going to create a classic. Mm -hmm. right, you, right. You, people that say that they're they're all messed up <laughs> because you're not going to create a the consumers are going to dictate what becomes a classic yeah so if one of my products that is out now becomes a classic then i'm going to allow that to stay in the line a little bit longer um i think the principle about each style has a true meaning that people can relate to mm -hmm. and so I'll probably change those up to give them different looks. One, to be trend relevant. Two, to make sure that, you know, I continue to deliver freshness. Because, again, I still operate from that mentality of wanting to push the limit. Like, coming out, I, you should have seen the first design that I had. They were all out there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this will never work. Mm -hmm. Because it's too far out there. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm brand new, so people aren't going to get it. So I've got to dial it back. But then I got to be able to give people like something that is fresh. And so that's how I got to kind of the three different personalities. Um, and so as I start to mature in the business, I think my designs will also kind of push the limits even that much more. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, just good business is being able to strike a balance between, you know, some things that people can call their essentials versus things that they want to peacock on. So, mm-hmm. uh, so I, the plan is to, you know, to continue to evolve the models, but should there be a model that the consumers decide that this is a classic and we want to stay with it, then I'll rock with so it. So what's your favorite? Of my line? Yeah. Actually, my is the one I'm wearing today. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, it's just way different. And that's you know, the entrepreneur. Yeah, this is called okay. the entrepreneur. And the entrepreneur is always going to be the style that pushes the limit a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, this one in particular, uh, the concept that I came up with for this one is called peak performances. Okay. So and so the whole notion around it is is drafting off of kind of the tunnel walk. So, you know, NBA guys come in. And they walk through um, the tunnel and you see what they have on and becomes right. kind of like a fashion show. Yeah. What a lot of people don't know, though, is that this is more about a mindset. Mm-hmm. So think about it. In typical NBA season starts. Game day, player goes shoot around, put up shots, get the game plan, go home, uh, take a nap, uh, get their pregame meal, whatever it is. Most guys are somewhat superstitious, but mm-hmm. they get their pregame meal, and then they step into their closet. That's so, when it's go time. Yes, that's when it starts. That's when, yeah, that's yes. crazy. I just thought about that because yeah. I, I remember. Yeah, that's football, probably how you did thing. playing football. Yeah. yeah. So, so think about yeah. it, like if you know that you got to go play against LeBron James, you know, six nine, two seventy, beast right. running up and down the court. Your beast mode might be okay. I'm wearing all black. I'm going to be menacing. Right. And so you look in your closet and you start to pick out the outfit that represents that. Or some guys might be like, shit, I got to have a ton of energy. Mm -hmm. So I'm wearing bright colors. I'm going to be flamboyant. Like I'm going to be hyped before I even get there. Right. So there's the mindset starts when you go into your closet. And then with those guys, it's, it carries on to the car that they're going to drive to the arena and all that. Right. Right. That's levels. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Right there. (laughs) But, but it's about a mindset. And so really what I did with this line, it started off with kind of that tunnel walk mindset Mm -hmm. that starts when you're looking in your closet. And Mm so I wanted people to have product that was going to work for them. And then how I got to this notion of peak performance is so you put it on. And at the end of the day, just like the the NBA guys, they get to the arena, they go through, they change clothes and they step on the court. That's their time to shine. Mm -hmm. And that's when they have, they want to have their peak performance. So in my line, peak performance became the studs that I put on it. Mm-hmm. Some of them have the the metallic foils on it um, for time to shine, um, and so that's how that concept came out. Oh. Came about. But I I just love it because it's different. It just it makes a statement, you know. But it's crazy. Like you, I wear it with just about anything, mm-hmm. and and it works. <laughs> So, so what's the uh, what's the website and everything so everybody know about that too? So codebygentry.com. Okay. So, and yeah. uh and then you got you got anything else before we wrap, we wrap up? up? No, you know, I, I think the only thing is one, I wanna I will say that one, I appreciate you for you know even reaching out, um, mm-hmm. hearing the story because I think, you know, uh I'm not that guy that likes to like peacock and stand out and be front and say pound my chest say me 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 right right um but i have had uh, an influence on the culture and what i realized is that what i can give back most is if there's another black brown kid or any kid out there Mm -hmm. that um has aspirations that that wants to do something in this world Mm -hmm. and i can help show them that someone that looks like them was able to kind of which is huge do something in this world um, that's what it's about. And so thank you for, you know, allowing me to kind of be able to share that. Um, and then, you know, I, I looked around and did your collection. I love folks who just love the game. Yeah. Um, and you've obviously done some pretty, pretty, uh, special things cause you got some heat up in here. <laughs> um, so kudos to it. you for, for staying true to the game this long and, um, you know, sharing your platform to educate folks. Cause you know, education is, is powerful. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's crazy. Just thinking about like all these different moments and how things have happened for me, just growing up here, like yep. obviously your Nike, Adidas, all the different headquarters around, like wearing samples as a kid and yep. everybody yep. got some type yep. of family ties to Nike. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and just establishing like, I'm going to be a sneakerhead when I get to high school and making that decision committing to it and it became a part of my lifestyle and uh it didn't fully like 
define who I am. But I think it's dope that sneakers have been able to help me. And I remember those moments that I've created from the shoes that you were a part of that you didn't even realize, like you said, that has helped and inspired somebody like me to build what I've done. And um, you guys have had huge impacts on a lot of our success without other people knowing it or even getting a chance to say it to you. So for me, I would say thank you as well, just because, like I said, I remember Wait, I was uh, just started right after the DMP pack came out. So for me, it was like, that was the goal. Yeah. You got to get that pack. Yeah, you yeah. you got to be the goat to get <laughs> yeah. that pack, you yeah. know, like, and going after stuff like that, chasing after shoes and, and seeing that and the stories and all the stuff and learning about the brand. Um, and then seeing not only MJ, but the people from the back end. And yeah. I love the opportunity to create that. That's why I like having this podcast is so dope because... You guys have amazing stories. You guys have done amazing things that have shifted the culture. And yeah, you got the one token person up at the top, but yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. everybody right here, yeah. like they had a huge play to yeah. why this person's so successful yeah. too. So yeah. that's real. That's yeah. real. That's I appreciate it. Um, oh, we got to do the final little fire round. So okay. all right. people ask me these questions all the time. So I always asking everybody else. Uh, favorite shoe of all time. For me, the favorite shoe of all time is is probably different than most people. But my favorite shoe of all time is Air Jordan Eleven. Okay, but be, mainly that's not different. You know, well, but <laughs> no, but but you know why? What's, what reason is different is because people don't realize how close that shoe was to not coming out. Really? Can you imagine the world without the Eleven? Like, I couldn't. So so so, 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 <laughs> so so just think about this, like. Back then, nobody had seen patent leather on shoes. You saw them on tuxedo shoes only. Right. And who wanted to wear a tuxedo shoe? Mm-hmm. Nobody. Mm-hmm. So, so when we brought, like, I was like, I, you couldn't tell me it was the best shoe in the history of shoes. When I first came in, I was like, this is it. This mm-hmm. is like the best. It's the best thing since chocolate cake. So, it, so you said put it on there, or like you saw no, it and you were like, that's it, or like well, no. So it? what happened was when the shoe came in, mm-hmm. we thought it was internal. We thought it was phenomenal. Okay. But back in the day, we used to be able to um, do focus groups. Mm-hmm. Now we can't do focus. I used to do them at my high school. Like see, we worked yeah. on football gloves. I made the elite socks. Like I did. Oh, a is that right? Yeah, I helped oh, with like nice. a bunch of projects too. I know so, what you're talking so, about. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So we would do focus groups. Now you can't do it because you put stuff out there. Social media gets it out there. Early. Yeah, counterfeiters right. get it. Yeah. You can't do nothing. But but back then we could do that. We could sit in focus groups, and we did them all over the world, and. Everybody was crapping on it. Take the shiny shit off the shoe and it'll be hot. Really? Everybody. Really? We have we hate maybe five to ten percent of people because you learned how to work in these focus groups. Like people would crap on it, and then certain certain kids, the kids that were kind of more early adopters, would pick it up and be like, "Something about this is actually all right." So then you start tapping in them. What did but, you did you have like a was it an all black sample? Was it the black? We had and a white? black the original. We didn't have Concord on it at the time, but it was black white. Concord. So it was a it was a Concord colorway, yeah, and people were like not yes. liking it, yes. Because I could see if it was like you know, because sometimes like a triple black and they just run no, the sample. Like. It was a Concord, and people were just like, because we had them all three. We had uh, we had the uh, the bread. We had well, everybody called the bread, but we had the bread. We had the uh, white Carolina, and we had uh-huh. the original Concord, and they were just like, take the shiny shit off the shoe, man. really. And we literally went back, and we were like, should we? take it off because we had so many people killing it and we're like nope like mj loves it it serves a functional purpose Mm -hmm. um it's disruptive that's what we're about we don't mind being disruptive we're rocking with it no matter what so we stuck to our guns and that's why it's my favorite shoe because it could have easily gone the other way right and but by us sticking to it it was proof that it, it became proof that you need to be you need to not be afraid. You mm-hmm. gotta be sometimes mm-hmm. you gotta be comfortable being yeah, uncomfortable. Trust it. Yeah. 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 So that's why now, be, now people like it because it's just a great shoe. Right, right. But I, it's my favorite because what well, people don't know <laughs> right. that that what went into to making sure that came about. Okay, okay. I, I know we're supposed to be wrapping up, but I got a couple <laughs> questions now. I'm sorry. That's all right. So two things. Cause I know you're like a part of doing like the Nike year and all that stuff yeah, and yeah, like yeah, yeah. And, and respecting the Nike year. Cause I'm the same way. Yeah. I'm like, you can't just be throwing it on everything. Yeah, yeah. Same thing with the Jordan 11. I feel like it should be like classics only type thing. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, what do you, what do you feel about that? Like 
with all the different colorways and it's like all right i get it y'all gotta like hit numbers for work and everything but yeah. like because I, I talk about that too i'm like oh y'all remember how they used to do 111 and yeah. now they do a men's and a yeah, women's one to, and they yeah, do the low tops yeah, and they did it yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah well and even back in the day we would do no more than for a year mm -hmm. you know and that was it you know if you got them you got them if you didn't well yeah <laughs> um so it, it's you know obviously changed um it's a fine balance, yeah. you know, because to your point, you're you're asked to run a business mm -hmm. and you got to hit numbers. And when you're dealing in a growth company, you got to do what you got to do. Right. Um, now, again, I talked earlier about, you know, not trying to to do do having to do things that you don't want to do. Right. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had on that one. Right. Trying to save the holy grail of of a of a shoe that is the all-time classic and then you know numbers aren't being hit and they're like all we gotta do is add another colorway <laughs> what <laughs> yeah that's all we gotta do but yeah you, you're 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 biting into the kind of the 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 specialness of what this shoe is all about every time you do it yeah because i always me and my dad talk about that too like we feel like it kind of devalues it a little yeah. bit um at least for the collector side yeah and yeah. it's like, how is that going to play, you know, 10 years from now? Yeah. Because we was like, oh, yeah, it's been successful for almost 40 years. Yeah. But it's like, everybody's like, oh, Jordans aren't going to be the same. Like, who cares for about those five, 50 years from now? Like, and I'm like, I don't know. It's interesting to see. We'll, we'll see how it all plays out and everything. But, I, you know, obviously my generation will keep it strong. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully you guys do. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, it's just interesting. So um, the other question, how many pairs of shoes do you have in your collection? I really don't know. Because, Which I figured that would probably yeah, be the answer. Because in 2014, they did an article on me. And at that point, we counted. And it was 3,514 pairs. Oh, you was exact with it. <laughs> yeah, I had to. <laughs> I had to because uh, I actually, there was something else going on. I was getting a divorce. And so I had to know what I had. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um so so that was 2014. Mm -hmm. I have no like since then. That's yeah. that's what we've, and we've, we've we've added nine years to that. Yeah, so, I was about to say the amount of stuff that comes yeah. out now compared yeah. to then. Like I'm more discerning about what I get now because one, I just don't have a lot of space, and you know, um, I find myself like um, I have my go to shoes. You know that mm -hmm. I just you know I'll always have like you know the conquerors i'll have a ton of those well actually i have from the defining moments back i have some pretty crazy stuff so og that, samples that and stuff yeah because yeah. i was supposed to originally be a three shoe pack okay okay it was supposed to be uh first championships was which his first one was at carolina okay so we had a uh, all, all three champions yeah. like all first yeah okay okay, yeah. okay okay so we had a converse that was done in white gold and had a carolina Jump, not a jump, it, man, but it had a shot. But that came in a different pack later. Well, it was supposed to. If the shoe came out, and well, Converse tried to bring because the they did out. the yeah. Because I remember they did a drop, and then y'all did like a second one after or something like that. Not while I was there. Or maybe I'm tripping. Or maybe yeah. there was a sample I seen. Or yeah, something. I think you saw a sample. Cause, yeah, because while I was there, they wanted to bring it back, and I said no. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but MJ kind of squashed it the first time, but it was originally supposed to be a three shoe pack. Um, but yeah, so I, don't know, I, I digress. But <laughs> <laughs> so having a ton of shoes. Well, one day if you ever decide to show your collection, hopefully I can be the one to review it with you. We'll see. It's, I'll it's put my bid in. So many stuff. So <laughs> I've got it in so many places right now. But yeah, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, everybody. Yeah, so they always ask me how many. Well, the other one is what's the most you spent on a pair of shoes, but. You yeah. can't really say yeah, that one because yeah. you I'll, just work yeah. there. So yeah, I don't. Have <laughs> I guess what is your uh, most what is your most prized possession sneaker that you have in your collection? Like the one that like I guess means the most to you. Uh well, so I have a ton that never came out. Samples that I thought were like phenomenal that should have come out. Mm -hmm. So I have several of those. I have some historical stuff that, you know, like that MJ was supposed to have, and he and I are the only ones that have it. So I, there's stuff like that that's out there. But to be quite honest with you, I probably say it's the shoe that I 
probably over the last five years have worn the most was um, is two. There's one. There was an Air Jordan Four that had my cartoon character on it. Oh, the G Money, like yeah, the white and tan yeah, one. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Those are fire. Yeah, it's kind of like the Sands, but a little bit different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, those are clean. And then uh, the all white black Air Force ones that have the same okay. logo on it. Okay, like, those two probably just because I feel like they represent me. They're sh- they're two shoes that um, I mean have a lot of meaning. Like the four was one of the first ones that I ended up working on with with the guys who were so, uh, in the product creation team. Um, so that's super special to me, uh, Air Force One, just because, you know, I ended up doing some things in sportswear as well. And so that shoe is just a timeless classic piece. Mm-hmm. And the mistake, the white black mistake was just, it's just me. I feel like you can wear that shoe with everything and right. it goes. And so to have my face on that one, right. like those two are probably my. That's dope. Yeah. Especially, man, during that time, like with Spike Lee and all that. Oh, like yeah. yeah. Meet and Spike. Yeah. Ooh, that's a that's some good stuff right <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, I appreciate it. If it's you got any bad. other deep dark secrets you want to share with us, we're here all day. <laughs> but <laughs> we besides covered that, most we of them, go. man. But yeah, hey, thanks again, man, and and uh good luck to you. Thank you. Continue to forge through this um, you know, and share kind of the whole game with all with everyone. Yeah, for sure. Appreciate yeah. it. You got it, bro. Yeah.